Hello, folks. Welcome to the International Euphonium Summit Living History Series. I'm your host, Nicholas Hofter von Heide, and we have a special guest all the way across the pond in England, in the UK, Dr. David Thornton. Welcome, 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 sir. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me, Nicholas. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to, to talk to everyone. Thank you. Absolutely. The, providing your experience is a, one, one of the you know top responsibilities we have. And we look forward to diving deep and, you know, coming across your bio, I was really stunned um, that you started lessons at eight years old. So what was it before that? When did you start, like, eyeing or thinking about euphonium? Um, it, it was all a bit of a surprise, really. I, I've got to say, um, I, I can't remember a conscious decision to take an interest in music uh, at uh, at primary school, I guess you call it elementary school, um, and um, uh, it was uh, simply a matter of my of, of music teachers coming into um, the classroom and asking for volunteers who wants to learn the violin, who wants to learn a brass instrument, and actually the string teacher came in first and said who wants to learn a violin, and I put my hand up. And so we went down the corridor in a bit of a group, but five or six of us, and they were doing some aptitude tests. I think some, some very, um, uh, you know, simple oral tests, playing an A on the piano and singing it back and all that. Anyway, I failed those tests and, uh, and was unfortunately returned to the classroom without a violin. Um, uh, maybe that was fate. I don't know. And then um, the week after, the brass teacher came in and said, "Is anybody interested in, in learning an instrument?" And I again put my hand up. I don't, I don't know where that enthusiasm um, came from. Um, my mum tells me I, I always sang a lot uh, when I was younger, uh, and I always interacted with any music that was on TV or, or, or roundabout. Um, but anyway, so I put my hand up, and I ended up with a euphonium. So I know a lot of people start on a, a trumpet or a um, a higher a higher pitched instrument. Um, I had this old, battered, smelly euphonium from the back of the band cupboard, um, and I took it home and presented it to my parents and said, "This is what I'm going to be learning." And they were, I think, they were probably quite horrified um, <laughs> at, at, at first. But uh, um, we bathed it and tried to uh, make it smell a bit better, and 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 it kind of goes from there. Actually, um, I was incredibly lucky that right from the start, when I started lessons uh, at eight years old, that I, I had a teacher called Craig Sproston. Um, he was, an, in, in, and, and I'm sure still is, a, a very enthusiastic man. Um, his lessons were based on on fun and, and being active. And um, I, I, I was enjoying myself straight away. And I think that's the key, isn't it? If you, if you enjoy doing something, you'll you'll keep doing it. And he were, he um, set it up so when I went home uh, and did my own personal work at home, I was I was still enjoying it. You know, it's not as if I just got the instrument out once a week ready for my lesson. Um, and, you know, he made sure I had things to do outside of the lesson that I found fun and I wanted to do as well. And uh, and so uh, it, it went from there really. And and, uh, and that's one of the things that you'll probably find that comes up again and again. One of the things uh, I wrote down for your questions a, a little bit later on was you know, hard work is actually enjoyable. Um, and I, I didn't, I mean, when you're eight years old, you don't tend to think of it as hard work, do you? But, um, uh, you know, just I sat down and, and, and did it. And um, it was the same for my piano lessons as well. I was I was learning uh, piano at the same time. And um, yeah, so, so it went from there, enthusiasm and enjoyment. That's awesome. So uh, you mentioned that you started piano lessons as well as euphonium somewhat at the same time uh piano was probably about a year after um and and i think i think it was my teacher actually craig who, who'd said um you know it would be great for david's understanding of of music in general to to, to have piano lessons um al alongside his euphonium and you know to, to to help me learn bass clef and just an idea of harmony and, um, and and those kind of things. And uh, that was certainly true. And for a little while, I've got to say, my, probably my, my piano was my main instrument um, over the euphonium. I was making a good progress on the piano. But um, again, I can't pinpoint a particular time when um, the euphonium took over, but it's, it certainly did. Um, and 
uh, yeah, but that, but that, um, I, I, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is 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 both series of lessons enhanced each other. Absolutely. So with Craig Spoxton, Spox, Spoxton, Sproston, 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 yes, yes. Sproston. Okay, with Craig Sproston's fun and active kind of approach to yep. euphonium lessons and such, did that transfer over into piano as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I had a different piano teacher, a lady called Anne Samson, um, and she taught my sister actually uh, as well. My, my sister's ten years older than me, but gave up piano pretty quick. Um, and again, she uh, she was a, just a, a lovely lady and um, uh, very skilled educator. Of course, again, when you're eight or nine years old, you don't you're not aware of, that you're in the presence of a skilled educator. But I can look back now and think, yeah, my, my attention was always. Um, uh, kept alive uh, by by the material and by the fact that progress was fast moving. You know, I, I always had a, um, a an attainable but clear goal in front of me uh, as 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 to as to what I needed to do, and and that was something that I, I was interested in. I, I am personally and still am quite goal orientated, um, and so if. Lockdown, locked, look, we're getting into serious business here already, but um, lockdown was quite difficult for me because goals disappeared. And um, and I had to kind of manufacture things uh, for myself to do. Otherwise, I found myself um, doing something else rather, rather than the things that were useful, useful to my professional life. But, um, uh, and I think I was like that when I was younger as well. And, um, and, and both, both teachers uh picked up on that pretty quickly and and i think that's a great part of education isn't it um uh twisting and turning your approach as as to suit the student that's awesome so did you find yourself if you recall when you're playing piano and taking your uh your mom's uh kind of where you started with singing and always singing along with stuff did you apply that to your piano playing as well like song and playing at the same time yeah i think so uh, I, I i think so um it's difficult to remember these things isn't it? i i know i know certainly now singing is, is a big part of what how i teach and how i practice personally um that whole vocal approach and the connections between wind playing and and uh, and singing um is 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 a vital thing isn't it and uh and so i can only imagine it must have been um i, I don't have distinct memories i've got to say of, 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 of this but but um but but it, it it must have been you know and and actually i've i've got two young sons now and and um nine and six years old and particularly the uh, the six year old Henry, he is constantly singing. He's like a little version of me. Um, whether it's uh, is the tune he likes best at the moment is the Indiana Jones soundtrack, and he's just down, da, 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 da. you know, you can hear wherever he is in the house because that's what he's singing. Um, so, so I, yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty sure I was uh, I was very much like that. And that that, as I say, that vocal approach has has gone right through into my playing now. Well, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense, kind of uh, looking at your written history that you have and hearing that you brought in piano uh, just a, a little under a year into uh, being uh, taught euphonium privately uh, at, your, uh, at age of eight. And then all those years of scales and the fundamentals it, it seems mm -hmm. like that was like just the rock star like kind of a combination that you needed to be the first euphonium ever at chetham school of music at 13. yeah yeah well um i i like patterns uh, you're asking about scales and and um and, and some of the fundamentals of music yes um i like i like patterns uh, and um and i like how numbers fit together and um and all of that so i always found scales uh, like an interesting puzzle that you know i mean that that, that uh, however many um, students i teach uh, most of them tell me how much they hate scales why have we got to play scales what, what why you know what, what why are you making us do this uh, or, and all, all of that kind of thing um and uh, again i don't ever remember thinking like that it it it, it felt like a natural 
um, thing. Uh, it felt like I was working out a puzzle. It felt like something that was quite natural to me being able to um, get get better and play more easily on on the instrument for both piano and euphonium, actually. Um, and and so uh, scales are very much part of, of 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 what I did and always have been, and and I do a lot of that with my with my students now. Uh, I'm a huge believer in um, uh, um, mu young musicians having as wide a range of musical experience and musical knowledge as possible. So uh, I also had uh, private music theory lessons. Um, at the same time, uh, um, wow. and I was very, I was very lucky. Um, and I, I have, I have spoken to my. Unfortunately, my father's no longer alive, but I've spoken to my mum uh, about this, and they were paying for three private lessons every single week. And you know, not, not we weren't a, a wealthy family, uh, and I was very lucky that my, my my parents felt that that was important enough um, uh, to, to to do that. And and again. I think because of uh, all of this happened in my early years, it's something that uh, follows straight through into my approach now. And and, and I uh, try and ensure with the RNCM students that I'm working with that they look at music, um, not just from a, a straightforward euphonium line, but they look at it harmonically. They look, look at it from the point of view of texture. Um, they study the accompaniments, whether that's uh, an orchestra score or whether that's a piano part. Um, to to understand understand the, uh, the the building blocks behind it, and um, uh, why I'm telling you this is because uh, I, I think that comes from my fascination with 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 puzzles and how things fit together um, mathemat mathematically, um, I, and I think that um, curiosity feeds the artistic side of my, uh, of my nature as well. You know, you, you, okay, so you mentioned puzzles, mathematics, numbers, patterns, and, yeah. and being goal oriented. So taking that and putting it all together seems like you would really love Sudoku. And there's a reason why I <laughs> mentioned this. So is, is that hunch correct? Uh, I don't, I, I don't do any Sudoku. Okay. Um, but uh, that, <laughs> but um, that's not because I don't like it. I just never have. I, I, and the same, I've I've never ever drinking drunk coffee either. I've just never ever. Um, I, I, it's just something that's not come up on on my radar for some reason. I know that's sure. very unusual with co with coffee, but um, it's just not something I've done. Um, so okay, that, so, that, that, that's a miss. That's a miss. <laughs> okay, so so if that okay, so the reason why I mentioned that is the kind of the perspective shifts that yeah. uh, the patterns allow our minds to kind of reframe what we're working on and come at it a different way. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah uh, absolutely. And again, that multi-angled approach is something that can be used for, for technique as well. Um, uh, I, I'm very lucky that I work with a, a very high standard of student at the RNCM. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> And um, I, I am, you know, I never take that for granted. Um, it is also a challenge sometimes as well because we, we work on technical things, um, and sometimes you have to find several different angles. In fact, it's imperative that you find several different angles to help students um, uh, develop technically. You know, even though they're already at a very high standard, mm -hmm. um, and and I try and deliver that in a way that that means that not only are they improving as players, but they're improving from a kind of ped pedagogical, pedagogical sense as well, spit that word out. Right. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, uh, when they get into teaching and, and when they um, start coaching and all of those kind of things, that they pass, the, pass these in, things on, improving their own analytical mind. Um, and, and I think because of the way, going back to my first teachers, Craig Sproston and, and, and Samson, because the way they taught, um, of course, I was much younger than the students that I teach, but because they used these building blocks and they were quite systematic, um, uh, and I, again, I, I felt like I could understand what I was doing all the time, you know, um, and, and, and I think that's important. I, I, um, I, I remember one of my science teachers at school um, saying that I was very inquisitive. I always wanted to know why. I couldn't take a piece of information just on trust. Why? 
does that work in the way it does? Um, and and I, I like to know that with brass playing and as 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 well and 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 music. Uh, and I think that's that's really important in order to really get to the uh, grips with anything artistic. It's great to get behind inside the mechanics of it, um, and and then you can really shape. Um, shape that machine if you like or shape that piece of music in in the form that you want it to be personally rather than in own. the form of yes exactly rather than in the in the form of the recording that you've been listening to so much right being like a robot <laughs> yeah exactly, oh fantastic yeah. so you know the only other piece that we're missing is your music theory private lessons in it, it just makes all the sense that you'd be as inquisitive or even more so with your music theory teacher private lessons uh for music theory so were were you just as inquisitive for that as you were in that science class yeah uh, yes i think so um and again it's it's all about patterns isn't it things connect together um and uh, I, I found that i could feed my instrumental playing by more knowledge of keys more more knowledge of of rhythm, rhythmic patterns um you know how how time signatures fit together kind of compositional process um all, all of those things that feed into um cadences you know all, all of that uh, that that fit into um uh the the building blocks of music and uh yeah i was fascinated by it and um uh that, that there you go, and, and and then just fast forwarding a little bit. Once I got a little bit older, um, and you know, we started studying Bach chorales and, and all of all wow. of that, and uh, yeah, it's it um, uh, it was something that I enjoyed uh, a lot because um, uh, so you mentioned uh, cheating school in music. So when when I was um, twelve years old, um, I, I again I don't remember the specific conversation with my parents, but I. I um, I decided, and it was my decision rather than being pushed by my mum and dad, that I wanted to go to a specialist music school rather than uh, a conventional um, conventional school. And so um, uh, we we looked around with the help of uh, my music teachers, and, and we found Cheetham's, which is in Manchester. Uh, at the time, we lived in Birmingham, which is in the mi middle of England. Uh, Manchester's about two hours' drive north of there, and. Uh, um, uh, and so we, we looked into it and uh, oh, it's a private school. So it's a fee paying school. And of course, the first reaction from my parents was that that's not possible because we, we can't we don't have the money to send you to. Uh, um, I was very lucky to go and audition and receive a scholarship, um, f you know, f for fortuitous, um, to, to say the least. And um, uh, and ended up getting a place at this. And it was a boarding school. So, of course, I was living there. Wow. Um, so um, I I. I I came home every three weeks um, from from school, and people people often ask me, "Well, that must have been harrowing at twelve years old to to leave home." Uh, actually, I don't remember that uh, at all. All I remember is being on is being on like a it felt like a constant summer camp, you know, and um, and with lots of young people that were in my position around me. Now, of course, this also meant I, I was the, um, the only euphonium player at the school at that time. Uh, it also meant I was surrounded by uh, musicians playing other instruments. So I, I grew up sharing a dormitory with um, uh, there was a, a jazz trumpet player, uh, a violinist, two pianists in in my in my dormitory. So that meant I was surrounded by that. Um, level of music that 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 kind of uh, those genres of music and, and the, the the repertoire of those instruments um and uh, and and that was great for me because um i think sometimes as young brass players even, even sometimes as professional brass players dare i say it um we can get a little bit narrow minded as as to our approach and to have uh, to grow up with the experience of of just chatting about um, the violin solo repertoire because um, you know they talked to me about what I was learning and, and as you do um, as when when you're at uh, um, high school um, and I, I chatted to them about what they were doing and you know we were going across to the practice block together um, and and uh, yes yeah, so, so that was a good a good grounding for me I wasn't thinking like a euphonium player I was thinking like a just a musician. Um, and um, and just to be clear, the, the kind of structure of the school. And actually, I, I work there now. 
Um, I'm, I'm one of the brass teachers uh-huh. at the school now. Um, so uh, during the day, again, this is, is it's like a dream come true, really. Uh, uh, during the day, there's timetable practice sessions. So you might have uh, um, lesson one might be maths. Lesson two would be practice. And then there's a little break. And lesson three, you'd go off and do a science lesson, lesson four, something else, lunchtime. And then maybe you'd have an ensemble lesson um, d- during a little bit of lunchtime. And then at some point in the afternoon, you might have another practice session. Um, so practice was timetabled during the day. And that sounds like they're forcing us to do it. But of course, um, I enjoyed it. So it was a, it was, it was a dream. That I did have friends and I, I did have people in my year group that, that didn't enjoy uh, being told they had to go to a particular room and, and practice at that particular time. They felt like they were being driven. I didn't ever feel like that. Um, and so it was just it was just a great environment uh, for for me to grow up in as as a young musician, um, and um, and and that all feeds back to several things we've talked about already: the vocal approach, you know, um, and the this idea of you know um, it's it's widely talked about, isn't it? You know, the way you see a cello bow going across the cello is is very very much like the the air going into a, into a euphonium, and and that was all happening. I didn't have to imagine it. Uh, it was all happening in front of me with my friends um and uh yeah so i was uh, the environment i was in i was very very lucky um because it spurred me on to practice it spurred it gave me great um experiences that really widened my um knowledge and a kind of awareness of music in general um and they they were great years and i i never ever um regret that decision to to move away from home and and go and experience that so so that must have been like okay so you have two boys and their your oldest is approaching that kind of time period mm-hmm. of where we're talking about now and kind of hindsight and retrospect your parents must have been so proud that you took the initiative to ask uh, for, you know, furthering your education, going into what U.S. would consider as a private school, um, yep. and then and taking the initiative, and then earning, the, literally earning that spot on your own accord. Uh, that that must have given them such a delight. I don't know what what was it like when you received that acceptance. Uh, incredible. I think I think. Um... It was more painful um, for mum and dad than I realised at the time. They they hid it from me very well. Now, uh, but uh, something I found, um, uh, oh, uh, oh n- not until I was in my twenties. I was going through a drawer at, at home at mum and dad's house, and I found this uh, bunch of letters. I don't again. I don't. My brain doesn't uh, uh, remember these things. But mum wrote letters to me every, every single week. Um, because of course this is before email and, uh, and all of that. This is this is 1991 when I started at, at right. Cheatham's. Uh, and Mum wrote letters to me every week. I, and I, um, I, I kept them uh, I, I, in a, a drawer at school, and they ended up in a, a plastic envelope. And I found these uh, when I was in my twenties at home. And uh, reading back um, now with the adult awareness that I've got, the kind of emotional te- intelligence that I didn't have then as a 12 year old, 13 year old. Um, uh, you can read between the lines how uh, worried, how apprehensive, how how much I suppose they they miss me, um, and and these were, weren't things I, I mean they they were very happy that I wasn't feeding them, um, you know I didn't really get homesick, uh, but but they, they they were very very concerned that um, you know I was away from home they didn't really know what was going on I, I spoke to them most days on the. Uh, uh, on the phone, there was a pay phone just along the corridor because it obviously before mobile phones. So, um, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they were proud, but they were you know equ- equally apprehensive. But um, it soon became clear that um, I, I was doing something that I loved, and with the various experiences that came through, they came to um, concert performances, and I played in some competitions and things like that, and I was having a, a, a good deal of success. Um, through my activities at the school. So it, it was clearly a good decision. And I think that's a great way to, a uh, great segue into leading uh, out of this uh, first in series with Dr. David Thornton, uh, just covering right up to his going and leaving to uh, Chetham School of Music, uh, which is extraordinary. Um, 
I want to thank everybody who's watching this right now. Uh, you can find more information on Dr. David Thornton at www.internationaleuphoniumsummit.com slash david Thornton, and uh, we have all the, we'll, we'll be updating that as we go, as well as all the interviews will be found there with him, as well as the playlist of the amazing cohort that includes Dr. David Thornton and so many others uh, around the globe. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, go over to the podcast where we cover uh, a little bit of the British Open that just happened a couple weeks ago, or... Oh, man. Was it a couple weeks ago already? Or was it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Wow. This time is... Yeah, it was. Wow. Um, I've, 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 been, I've done a trip to Denmark since then. <laughs> so that's right, because they, they had a brass band festival <laughs> uh, competition just recently as well, right? No, well, no, this was... I, I did a rehearsal weekend in Copenhagen last weekend. But the weekend before that was the show. But, so, right, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, always, it's always go. <laughs> right, uh, so uh, check out the podcast. Uh, if you're currently listening to the podcast, just hang tight. Uh, we're going to uh, switch back over to the podcast, and you all can get more of a deep dive on Dr. David Thornton and where we're going to cover maybe a couple more uh, points. And uh, until next time, everybody, thank you so much for joining this Living History series. Uh, number one for Dr. David Thornton. Thank you so much, Dr. David Thornton, for, uh, wow, what a, what, what a first couple of years. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you.